Hi, my name is Dr. Li Xing Cheng, and I'm an associate physician and endocrinologist at Brigham and Women's Hospital in Boston, Massachusetts. In this video, we'll be talking about SGLT2 inhibitors and GLP-1 receptor agonists. Today's key takeaways are, we'll understand the compelling reasons for choosing an SGLT2 inhibitor versus a GLP-1 receptor agonist first. Now that we've looked at the major outcomes trials in cardiovascular disease and kidney outcomes, let's turn to a practical question. If both SGLT2 inhibitors and GLP-1 receptor agonists have potential use in diabetes and cardiovascular disease, when might we choose one over the other? Let's look at three particular areas of consideration. Compelling medical indications, comorbidities and side effects, and administration. Let's look at medical indications first. There are several medical indications for which you might consider an SGLT2 inhibitor over a GLP-1 receptor agonist, or vice versa. For reduction in major adverse cardiovascular events, particular in atherosclerotic cardiovascular disease, both classes of agents have shown significant reductions. When turning to specifically heart failure, SGLT2 inhibitors are the class that have shown specific reduction in adverse heart failure outcomes, and those are the class that are recommended for particular use in patients with heart failure. When looking at kidney disease, SGLT2 inhibitors have been studied in kidney outcomes trials, as we just reviewed, and they have more compelling indications for use to reduce the progression of kidney disease. They've been studied with harder outcomes, as we discussed, such as progression of creatinine and progression to renal transplant or renal replacement, whereas GLP-1 receptor agonists show as secondary outcomes benefit in kidney disease, mainly in softer outcomes such as reduction in albuminuria. Of note, GLP-1 receptor agonists are currently being studied in kidney outcomes trials specifically. When thinking about glucose lowering and hemoglobin A1C lowering, GLP-1 receptor agonists are among the most effective agents for reduction of glucose in type 2 diabetes. And these are more powerful agents compared to SGLT2 inhibitors. And finally, when you're thinking about a lot of patients who deal with overweight and obesity, both SGLT2 inhibitors and GLP-1 receptor agonists are often associated with significant weight loss, but the weight loss is usually more modest with SGLT2 inhibitors, whereas GLP-1 receptor agonists have more robust weight loss outcomes. And those are the agents to think about in particular when overweight and obesity are your compelling indications. When we think about comorbidities and side effects, there are a few conditions to be aware of when you're thinking about prescribing an SGLT2 inhibitor or a GLP-1 receptor agonist. For SGLT2 inhibitors, if a patient has had a history of recurrent GU or genitourinary infections, that might be a reason to be cautious about SGLT2 inhibitor use, as they have been associated with a higher risk of GU infections, in particular, genital mycotic infections, such as vaginitis in women and balanitis in men. SGLT2 inhibitors have also been associated with a rare risk of diabetic ketoacidosis, and if a patient has had a history of that, that's one specific caution to be aware of with SGLT2 inhibitor use. Finally, in patients who have a history of severe peripheral artery disease, especially if they have had a prior amputation of the lower extremities or active diabetic foot ulcers, that may be a consideration to be cautious with SGLT2 inhibitor use, as one of the agents, canagliflozin, was shown to have an increased signal for an increased risk of lower extremity amputations. When you're thinking about GLP-1 receptor agonist use, consider avoiding GLP-1 receptor agonists if a patient has had a history of gastroparesis or delayed gastric emptying. The reason for this is GLP-1 receptor agonists actually slow gastric emptying, and they can worsen symptoms of gastroparesis. In patients who have a history of active gallbladder disease, that's another reason to be cautious about GLP-1 receptor agonist use, as they have been associated with a higher risk of gallstones and adverse gallstone-related events, including cholecystitis. In patients who've had a history of pancreatitis, also be cautious with GLP-1 receptor agonist use, as there may be an increased risk of pancreatitis, although this has not been formally confirmed in studies, it still appears as a caution on the label for GLP-1 receptor agonists. 
In patients who have a history of MEN2, which is multiple endocrine neoplasia 2, or medullary thyroid cancer, which is a relatively rare form of thyroid cancer, GLP-1 receptor agonists are contraindicated. This is because in rodent models, GLP-1 receptor agonists were associated with an increased risk of these types of cancers. These are pretty rare conditions across patients, but they're something to be aware of. And again, they appear on the label for GLP-1 receptor agonists as warnings for contraindications. Finally, in patients who have a history of proliferative retinopathy, consider being cautious with GLP-1 receptor agonist use as there have been associations with increased risks of adverse retinopathy events. These are thought to be driven by significant reductions in glucose and in hemoglobin A1C due to the potency of GLP-1 receptor agonists. If you have patients who have a history of retinopathy, consider consulting with their ophthalmologist or optometrist before starting a GLP-1 receptor agonist. Let's wrap up by looking at administration differences between SGLT2 inhibitors and GLP-1 receptor agonists. SGLT2 inhibitors are oral medications that are given once a day. Compare this to GLP-1 receptor agonists, which are mainly given as subcutaneous injections, and they're typically given twice daily, once daily, or once weekly. The most commonly used GLP-1 receptor agonists are administered once weekly. There is one oral option available for GLP-1 receptor agonists, and that's oral semaglutide, which is taken once daily. The caveat with oral semaglutide is, while it's been shown to have cardiovascular safety, it hasn't yet been shown to have the same degree of risk reduction in major adverse cardiovascular events as once weekly subcutaneous semaglutide in an adequately powered trial. This is the topic of an ongoing trial called SOUL, which should be published in a few years. Thinking about administration is a very practical consideration for patients, and many patients would be very amenable to a once daily pill. It can take some more education to get a patient used to the idea of a subcutaneous injection, but oftentimes with a shared decision-making process, many patients find that, for example, a once weekly subcutaneous injection is a very reasonable and practical medication to administer. Thank you so much for watching. I hope you found this topic helpful.